to march in the field of battle when this warfare be ended. Hallelujah. When this warfare be ended, I'm a soldier of the Jubilee. This warfare be ended. I'm a soldier of the cross. Welcome to Clinton Church Restoration's online community read of The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. The mission of Clinton Church Restoration is to create an African-American heritage site and cultural center at the historic Clinton AME Zion Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where W.E.B. Du Bois was born and raised. As a cultural hub inspired by Du Bois' work as a seminal writer, scholar, and activist, this new center will use interpretive exhibits and contemporary programming to explore his complex life and legacy, celebrate the work of this freedom church, and share hidden and untold stories of African American life in rural New England. Our 14 week community read of The Souls of Black Folk will be moderated by Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, historian, board member, and chair of our Scholars Council. Each week, she will be joined by a guest scholar for a presentation of a single chapter of Du Bois' classic text, followed by a discussion with the audience. If you are joining us live, we invite and appreciate your participation. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. For best results, we recommend you have the most recent version of the Zoom app downloaded on your device. Attendees watching via a browser may not have all the interactive features available. To see the full schedule for this community read or to learn more about the project, please visit our website at clintonchurchrestoration.org. Thanks for joining us. When this warfare be ended, I'm a soldier of the Jubilee. This warfare be ended, I'm a soldier of the cross. Children, you'll be called on to march in the field of battle when this warfare be ended. Hallelujah. Good evening, and welcome to our eighth session of the community reading of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. We are very pleased to have with us this evening Professor Kaisi Lehman from the University of Mississippi. Professor Lehman is an American writer, editor, and professor of English and creative writing at the University of Mississippi. He is the author of three full-length books, a novel, Long Division, and two memoirs, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, and Heavy, that, uh, his most recent work that came out in 2018. Uh, we are very, very pleased to have uh, Professor Lehman with us here um, as uh, different from a lot of our uh, presenters, uh, being an active writer. And we are really, uh, really, really uh, open to listening to his interpretation of chapter eight of the Souls of Black Folk. Uh, we will begin our discussion uh, with some comments from Professor Lehman, followed by questions from our participants. Please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen at any time. Professor Lehman, welcome. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you? <laughs> it took a while. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones Need, for inviting me um, into this space. I don't know if we feels like a space, but hopefully by the end, it will feel like a space. Um, and I just want to thank you for a, not just extending the generous hand to asking me to come into one of your communities, but also I said this to Amina too, uh, a few weeks ago, but the first time I met y'all up near Great Barrington, I think. No, you know, a, a long way from Great Barrington. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't, you know what? When it's up north, it's all the same to me. I was in, uh, I, we were in the Pocono. No, where were we? Where were we? Saratoga. We were, Saratoga, right. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I thought I was, I thought Great Barrington was right next door to tell you the truth. But anyway, <laughs> um, thank you for just being so kind and um, rigorously kind. kind and, 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 you know, a lot of us 
who are not from the north, when we get up north, sometimes, you know, we can feel various things, but I just felt not just happy, but I felt at home um, because of you and your family and y'all have just been so kind to me ever since. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, the do that I think Du Bois is owed, not just by people we call black writers, I mean, black thinkers, but also from people like me who are much more concerned with like how to make books than how to write books. And I think if we look at souls of black folk beyond everything that everything has been talked about as just like this absolute amalgamation of styles, right? Um, I think that to me, you know, beyond the veil, beyond black reconstruction, which I think is like the masterpiece beyond all of that stuff. I was, as a young person who had to read the boys, like I was just always enamored with like the way different styles of writing could just show up in an essay or a paragraph that I didn't expect. And Du Bois did something to make me believe that like these confluences of styles were like intentional. I think a lot of times you get lots of styles that seemingly don't belong. If you don't believe in the author, you don't believe in the style. And so I owe Du Bois a ton for having a job, for having everything else, but also I owe the boys mostly for showing me that you can make books and make paragraphs like from styles that you've never seen put in books before. So I just wanna start there. And I also wanna say, I'm interested in why y'all picked me for this chapter because of all the chapters in this <laughs> iconic seminal text, I think this is the chapter that rubs me the wrong way as a black Southerner. So can I start um, Dr. Jones Sneed by just asking why this chapter, I'm saying, I'm asking with a smile too, why you picked me for this chapter? Well, it wasn't intentional, let's say. Okay, okay, okay. Um, It wasn't intentional. And in fact, if we, I had to do it all over again, the chapter I really like to choose you for is the of the coming of John, because uh, that is his the only fictional, uh, supposedly fictional yes. piece um, in the souls of black folk. And yes. because you're a writer, and um, and Du Bois is trying his hand at fiction in that in that chapter, I would have loved your feedback. And and especially I think it, that chapter is also close to. Um, some of the writing of Richard Wright, which yes. you, know, uh, you know is is your forefather. So, um, right. but uh, some of the other people who um, who said yes first, uh, somebody chose that chapter. I think mm. because of the date and not necessarily for the um, uh, for that. So, um, um, Martha Jones, who just uh -huh. wrote the uh, book Vanguard about Black yes. women in the vote um, um, uh, at John Hopkins. She's from John Hopkins. Martha chose that chapter. And so Martha okay. has a PhD in, in uh, law and in history. So I'll be very interested in see what she's gonna do with that. So this is, just a, this is just a toss up with you, but I thought that this chapter was very interesting because it's talking about the Black Belt and that Black yes. Belt runs from Georgia through Alabama, through Mississippi, and talks about some of our four people, you yeah. know, and what that they had to kind of go through. So right. I thought you would find it interesting, and I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say about that, and Absolutely. why it rubs you the wrong way. <laughs> well, okay, so I, 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 I just want to make sure, you know, because Du Bois is, is uh, it's interesting, he's nobody's mama, but he's also he's almost like everybody's mama in, in in the academy. You know what I mean? Like you you gotta you gotta you gotta start letting people know how much you appreciate the boys, um, before you go on and let people know some of the ways that he, like all creators, m might have reduced people who are traditionally reduced. So one of the things I, one of the questions that I asked myself about this chapter when I read it the first time. And then when I reread it and reread it again for this uh, event was, 
I think I ask myself often as a writer and Du Bois makes me ask myself again, like is the setup worth the punchline in this chapter? Is the setup worth the punchline? And if, and if, and if, we, and if we generously say that the punchline is an attempt by Du Bois to talk to possibly white Northerners, possibly uh, liberal white folks, possibly white folks who are on the fence um, about what is happening, not just to black people writ large, but black Southerners, and what he calls black peasants in the black belt. If, if the aim is to, is to improve the lot in the life of black Southerners in the black belt, again, people he calls black peasants, do we then excuse any sort of mischaracterizations of those black Southerners that Du Bois partakes in? And that's the question I have to ask myself when finishing this chapter, um, because I mean, we, we, I wanna go through it because there's so many times when like, if you close your eyes and you put sections of this in the Moynihan report, they would read as Moynihan, right? He talks about us as, I mean, he, it's a setup. He talks about black peasants as, as shiftless. He talks about our more, uh, their morality being suspect. Um, he talks about sexual proclivities, like morality is, he talks about um, how shocked he is that black Southerners live on top of one another. And that is something he says we give often to Northern people, right? Like in, in terms of shacks and shanties down South. And, and, and I wanna get into the specifics of it, but I, I, again, I wanna hold out the possibility that he is reducing um, black abundance, black, uh, labor, um, black resistance, black living. I, I, want, I, want, I want to work with the possibility that he's reducing those folk who are my predecessors in order to get something. What that something is, I don't know. But I think that question, what is the something is connected to something we often ask ourselves of Du Bois. Like, to whom was he writing? I get this question a lot as a writer. Who's your audience? I'm sort of interested in that question. When I get it, I'm sort of interested in that question when I read this chapter, particularly when I read Souls as general, but I'm much more interested in the question of not to whom was Du Bois writing, but what did Du Bois want the audience to whom he was writing to do? And was he willing to diminish, I think, you know, black peasants or black poor folks in the South in order to get this white readership to do. So I wanted to just start there and, and ask you, Francis, like what do, what, because you know far more than I do, what was the boys at, attempting to get done in this chapter? Like not just who was his audience, but what did he want his audience to do to and for the people he calls black peasants? That is such an interesting um, uh, take on it. And, and it seems that what Du Bois does is that he writes about the lowest of the, uh, of the race or of, of the culture in order to, the, the take off is these people would not have been this, if this is what you call them, because mm -hmm. going back at them, all the kinds of uh, descriptions that whites use against blacks. Mm -hmm. um, and, he's, and he is saying in the end, they would not have been like this right. were it not for the middle passage, right. were not it for all of the uh, hundreds of years of slavery, were not it for debt peonage, yes. were it not for you know, that these people didn't get this way because they wanted to be this way. And he's trying to show uh, uh, the white audience, I think the humanity, I mean, I think that's the, the whole thing of souls is that black people have souls, black people right. are human beings. They hurt, they bleed, they cry, mm -hmm. they die, just like anybody else. And, but I don't think that, um, and this is what we, we talk about a, a lot in, in the 21st century, we talk about white privilege. Mm -hmm. And um, that whites don't own up to the debt yes. that they owe to black folk. Right. Uh, and they don't own up to the debt that of the, the harm that they have done to black folk. Yes. And they wanna always blame the victim. And I think that Du Bois is saying in this chapter, 
you cannot blame black folk for being whatever they are, right. thief, murderer, you know, you know, the peasant who's working on the land because they are in this shape because you right. caused it to be so. Yeah, and, 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 and that's the tension for me in this chapter is that it's almost like uh, Baldwin's critique of, of right, right? Of native son, which is like, I mean, and Baldwin is not generous at all, right? Like Baldwin is like, we don't need protest literature. We don't need literature that reduces particularly black people to ideas, right? To causes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm very hesitant about stepping into that argument as someone who reaps the benefit of protest literature, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But as you said about the debt, like this is the question I just keep coming back to and I think I'm gonna articulate it probably five or six different times during this conversation. But if Du Bois is trying to get his audience to pay a debt, is it, is it, is the cost worth it? Is it worth it to, to, to say, for example, and we all have different books, so I'll just say, um, on mine, it would be like the, the fourth page of the essay, looking now at the county black population as a whole, Du Bois writes, it is fair to characterize it as poor and ignorant. Perhaps 10% compose the well-to-do and the best of laborers, while at times 9% are thoroughly lewd and vicious. The rest, over 80% are poor and ignorant, fairly honest and well-meaning, plotting and to a degree shiftless with some but not great sexual looseness. I, I, again, I think a lot of us want to be generous with Du Bois, but the question to me just has to, we have to ask ourselves as creators, uh, as cultural workers, at what point does the aim of, let's just use the word freedom, um, I always use the word liberation, uh, to get yourself out of, at, at what point is, 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 is like reducing black folk to, as he says, <laughs> poor and ignorant, fairly honest, well-meaning, plotting, and to a degree shiftless with some, but not great sexual looseness. Like at what point does the description of the people you're asking white folks to stop, to pay, pay their debt to, like it, at, at what point are you doing too much damage to the actual people by reducing? And a larger question I had of Du Bois at this point in Du Bois's career, and I think, you know, I think a lot of folks could, could chime in on this, but I would love to hear uh, what you have to say about this, Professor Jones Sneed. It's like, is Du Bois playing a cunning game? Ironically, like the game some say in the South Booker T was playing. Like, does he mean what he says? And or is he saying it just to get white folks to pay that debt? Does he believe what he's saying about these black Southerners in this chapter? And or is he is he is he saying, look what you've produced? Look, you know, right is saying, look at the monster you've produced and bigger, you need to you need to rectify that. Du Bois seems to be saying something maybe different, but I don't know if it's less harmful or not. But what are the stakes, right? Like what, like, 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 and 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 to what end, like, like. And at this point, he's been teaching, right? He's been teaching down there. It's not like he just visited. And it, re it reads like he just visited and bounced and made some sort of, but he, you know, he's there. He, I don't know if he's of the people or knows the people, but this is an attempt to persuade. And, 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 and I guess the question that I have for all of us, and particularly for you, Professor Jones Sneed, is like, if Black folk are attempting to persuade white people into doing right by Black folk, does that persuasiveness lose its it's 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 potency when you describe black folks in the worst pos potentially the worst po the worst possible kinds of ways you can describe us. Does it lose potency? Are we like, hey, the aims were right, so who cares about how we got there? What do you think about that, Professor Jones Sneed? Uh that's really a, a big question. <laughs> uh, and um uh, certainly I would hope that at this point in time in, in Du Bois's career, that he's using um, his description as kind of like a batting boy right. um, uh, for the general public because uh, chapter seven and eight was uh, had been published before mm -hmm. um, in Atlantic Magazine as one piece. 
and um, and then what he's trying to do is use data to convince uh, people of of just the lives of black people in the South, because at that point in time, the majority of black people lived in the South, right. and here, right. and here, and but he's saying that once they got a little bit of education, uh, what they do is that they go north because they find that what's the the trials and tribulations of the South are so great that they cannot prosper, even if they are in, in that 10%. Right. And he talks about that 10% usually leaves the South and kind of goes North. And yes. he says, what are you gonna do with the land? You know, who is going to call the land unless you have, you invest something into these people who are actually living on the land right. uh, one way or the other. So I think he's using it, uh, my interpretation is that he's using it as a kind of a batting boy. So mm -hmm. for nothing else, if these people are the agricultural workers of tomorrow, it, 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 it behooves us to invest in them, you know, yes. you know, whether they are white or whether they are black, you know. He doesn't talk about the whites, but there are a lot of whites who are living at the same level or just above right. the same level as the black presence are at that very point in time. So, yeah, and and and, I, and, and so and and when we if we go with that reading again on my page would be one seventy eight. I think we have different pages. Right. Um, du Bois writes they are careless because they have not found that it pays to be careful. Again, he's talking about people he calls black peasants, mm -hmm. black southern folk. They are careless because they have not found that it pays to be careful. On the other hand, this is a few lines down, the white landowner argues that any attempt to improve these laborers by increased responsibility or higher wages or better homes mm -hmm. or land of their own would be sure to result in failure. He shows his Northern visitor. And again, I'm interested in like whether Du Bois places himself as part of, as this Northern visitor or some other group. Mm -hmm. He shows his Northern visitor, the scared um, and wretched land the ruinous mansions, the worn out soil and mortgages acres and says, this is Negro freedom, right? So, so here we see a critique, like, right, of, of white uh, landowners, right? Like, there's, there's, a, like there's, 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 there's an overt critique of, of, of landowners here. And, and, and as a writer, like, you know, often teach my students, we need to read as writers, right? Like, mm -hmm. meaning we're reading each line to see how it's constructed, but we're also reading each line and thinking about how we might re re rewrite that line in a way that might be more effective, more potent, whatever. And again, like, I'm just wondering, and I think I come to an answer, but I don't like my answer. Like, I just don't know if, if, if Du Bois had to take every stereotype that white folk of the South and the North and everywhere else have of black folk and say, you know what, those stereotypes you have, a lot of those are true. They're very, very true, but you made them true. And then he does what you said at the end, which is like, you know what, and we call them shifters, shiftless, but there's all of this other internality. But by the end, you've already told us that we're like sexually loose, we don't have any morals, we're like, you know, we're plotting, we don't really know what's going on, you know, we're careless. And I, I'm, I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, as a, as a writer, I just don't, I just, I just have to keep coming back to this question. It's like, are the stakes worth it? Are the, are the stakes worth it? He writes, let me show you another, another, another section that really, really got me. Okay. Um, Near the end of the essay, he says, if all the black landowners who had ever held land here had kept it, and here again is like, you know, Georgia, this, this mm -hmm. part of Georgia, or left it in the hands of black men, the Negroes would have owned nearly 30,000 acres than the 50,000 they, they now hold. And yet these 15,000 acres are a credible showing a proof of no, of no little weight of worth and the ability of the Negro people. And, you know, as the piece goes on, he writes, out of the hard economic conditions of this portion of the Black Belt, only 6% of the population have succeeded in emerging into a peasant proprietorship, proprietorship. And these are not firmly fixed, but grow and shrink in number with the wavering of the cotton market. Fully 94% have struggled for land and failed, and half of them sit 
in hopeless serfdom. And I guess that's what I just want to say is just like I, 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 if it's if it's a, if it's a push pushback, I think it's a regional and race pushback. And I think we definitely have to talk about the way gender works, and not just this chapter, but all of Du Bois's chapters. I think in this in this in this book, mm -hmm. but but the the like I what I want to say, and I want people to push back is like I don't think you can reduce a people in order to in order to ask people who've helped make them i don't think i don't think you can ask white people to help save a specter they created once you once you show you believe the specter like and and i think what you i just want to go to the section you talked about earlier because it is important when he starts to like flip this idea of 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 black folks uh black black laborers being shiftless mm -hmm. um he says let me find it. Um, give me one. Okay, so he says, here we go. Um, one was driving listlessly. Again, this is the description. I think I think the descriptions of not just the land and not just the numbers, because there's so much numbers and numerology and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. but the description of the bodies. One yeah. was Robin, listlessly bent forward, his elbows on his knees, happy-go-lucky, careless picture of air responsibility, right? He's mm -hmm. describing these young Black fellows, he calls. Um, the other was fast asleep in the bottom of the wagon. As we pass, we notice an ear of corn fall from the wagon. They never saw it, not they. A rod farther on, we noted another ear on the ground, and between the creeping mule and town, we counted 26 ears of corn. Shiftless, he writes, with a question mark. Mm -hmm. Yes, the personification of shiftlessness, and yet, and this is what I think is important, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, follow those boys. They are not lazy. Tomorrow morning, they'll be up with the sun. They work hard when they do work, and they work willingly. They have no sordid, selfish, money-getting ways, but rather a fond disdain for mere cash. They loaf before your face, work behind your back with good-natured honesty. They steal a watermelon and hand you back your lost purse intact. Their great defect is laborers lies in their lack of incentive beyond the mere pleasure of physical exertion. And what I'm asking, they are careless because they have not yet found that it pays to be careful. Yeah. And, what, and what I'm asking myself as a writer is, why does Du Bois need to use anything else but the second part of that critique? I'm not saying he needs to paint all Black folks, all Black laborers, all Black Southerners as like completely virtuous, hardworking, super imaginative, like quick-witted and all of that. But what, like, what gain does he get by playing into this game of, of Black folks being, in some, to some degree, shiftless and immoral? Mm -hmm. um, and, and as someone who studies so much Du Bois, like, did it work? Like, not 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 over overall, but in this chapter, like, if his if his audience was white folk, white Northerners, possibly you know white folk down south who may have had some like centrist bent, like if if white folk generally or writ large are his audience for this chapter, and he's trying to show all these white folk how these black Southerners live, like in the hopes that these that these particular white folks who read this will pay a debt that they don't even think they owe. Like, was it successful? And if it was not successful, and this is where I come down, I think people might have a lot to say to me, is like, I just don't, I don't think it's worth it. I don't think you reduce black human beings to fucking shiftless, amoral, blah, 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 in order to get white folk to what? See them as, as, as not shiftless? Like, I, 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 I really, I, for, for the life of me as someone who like, you know, <laughs> like bows to, to to the boys i i this, this is just a chapter where i I'm, I'm glad as a human being that someone so miraculous and wonderful could make these mistakes because when i make these kind of mistakes i don't need to beat myself up but i do need to call myself out and i just i i i don't know what is to be gained by saying that like black people in the south who bust their ass who have created amazing traditions right who have fought, who have lost, are like, I don't know what we get by using the word shiftless, sexually loose, immoral, plotting, trudging. Is it worth it? Was it worth it to describe your people that, our people that way in order to ask white folk to save them? 
that's 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 one of the biggest questions I have for the audience, but also I I, I hope that you could talk me out of where I landed, Professor Jones. I, I mean, you're you're doing a really convincing job of me. Um, the only thing that I could say as a historian is in 1903 there were several ways of people uh, trying to um, figure out what would help black people, especially after reconstruction and, and after uh, the debacle that happened in 1877 when they pulled out all of the troops. Right. Black people, um, you know, to the wills of the KKK and other th kinds of things, you know. So what do we do now? You know, how, I mean, Booker T. Washington um, had um, a theory, uh, a philosophy about what happened. And so here's Du Bois on the other side having uh, that same right. kind of philosophy of what happens. You know, the, the same kind of philosophy that we uh, talked about in the 1960 of a Malcolm and a Martin, you know? Do yes. we work within the system, you know, and, and pray that people will change their ways in some kind of way? Or, uh, or we go with Malcolm and said, you know, the ballad of the bullet, you know? So, right. you know, which one do we do? And at this point in time, I think that Du Bois is trying to work within the system to uh, for a, a kind of an integration of, of, of giving some kind of dignity to Black folks one way or the other, saying that you just can't leave them in this kind of manner. You know, you have mm -hmm. to see that whatever they are, you have created that and you have to be a part of the solution to help, you know, the one way or the other. Yeah. Um, whereas um, I think Washington is simply saying, you know, give us our communities and leave us alone and we will, you know, we will raise up ourselves by our own bootstraps and we will kind of right. make it. But right. we know that even when uh, Black people made it during that point in period of time, um, Ida B. Wells points out that yeah. Um, you know, they will come in uh, and they would try to lynch you. In fact, not try to, they would lynch you right. for being prosperous in this kind of capitalist kind of system. So what, what will work, you know? You that's know. a great question. That is, that's it, right? I yeah. mean, and I think that question is why I'm still lean toward a kind of generosity. But I think some people have noted that, you know, Du Bois was an empirical sociologist, um, Washington, uh, Laura wrote it, wrote in here, was a vocational educator, absolutely. Yet, one of the things that we laud Du Bois for is when he breaks the bounds of empirical sociology, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and, and so what I want to do is like, if we're going to laud him for breaking the bounds of, of empirical sociology and laud him for doing a kind of lyrical witnessing, as we should, we also, as, especially as culture workers, I think, should hold it, hold, hold him accountable for the ways that he places himself as higher, smarter, more like stable and everything. And, but I'm torn on that too, because on one hand, I wonder what happens if Du Bois writes this and uses the, the, the pronoun we instead of they, right? Like I, I wonder what happens, but then again, would that just be, I think, partaking in another kind of like massive um, uh, dis dishonorable utterance by claiming to be of the same status that that these quote unquote black peasants are. I'm not sure, but I but I do as a reader think that like the black working folks in Mississippi, he talks about Texas a little bit, Alabama, all of Georgia. I, I don't know, fam. We I think we deserve a little bit more, a lot more actually, because I'm not sure what. And, and I'm saying this again. I just want to make sure I'm being clear. I'm not sure that what Du Bois' aims are, and I think Du Bois is like the aims are to free us by any means necessary. I'm not sure that those aims and the means line up. I mean, this is not, I don't know how people read this, read this chapter, if you've read this chapter before, but we would never, we as, as Black Southerners would never let white folk write about us this way, right? Like if we could stop it. Mm -hmm. And we and we and we would and we don't want we don't want white we don't want black northerners to write up write about us this way. But much more importantly, what what's missing for me in this, like the 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 the, the intervention that I feel like this essay, and I'm talking about this as an essay, and I'm talking as an essayist, is that there's no there's very little um, positioning anywhere in the essay of Du Bois as a subject who is 
potentially shiftless, potentially sexually loose, potentially careless. All of the things that he talks about, about Northern, about Southern black peasants, he, he doesn't even not just say, I'm not that. He doesn't do the hard thing, which is hard in essays, is to like talk about your relationship, not to those people, but to this concept. What is your relationship, W.E. Du Bois, to carelessness? What is your relationship to sexual, uh, quote unquote, looseness? And are you talking about men and or women and our genderqueer folks in that, in that section? I'm not sure. I just wish that Du Bois use some of his oh so great witnessing and critiquing of this group of folks over here who made me. I just wish he turned that same oh so introspective light in this essay on himself. And I think there's spaces to do it. I'm not saying he needed to navel gaze, but in the absence of that, in this essay, and I think it's important where this essay occurs in the book, I'm about to say something that I never said before. I think it's okay to sometimes like our giants um, are negligent. And I'm gonna use a word that he used to talk about my people, lazy. And if you're gonna be lazy, if you're gonna be lazy, if you can talk about the people who made me lazy, that's cool, but I need to know your relationship to laziness. And then I need to you know your relationship to the performance of laziness. And then I need to know your relationship to the white folk to whom you're writing and your relationship to the black folk to whom you're describing. And I don't, I don't see that in this chapter and I think I just have to say that. <laughs> I don't want to say it, but I have to say it. And maybe other people can chime in now. I know we only said we only had like 20, 30 minutes to talk about this. Yeah. yeah. But let's see if other people have some other things they want to jump in here and say. Oh, uh, uh, Kayusi, this has just been um, uh, marvelous uh, in raising questions about Du Bois uh, yeah. in, in this manner. So Mar uh, Marissa Massery, who uh, joins us uh, each week, uh, has the first question and she asked, uh, this is the first chapter where I really felt myself having an internal pushback against some of Du Bois's ideas, sexual immorality aside, I was struck by the story of the two black fellows who unbeknownst to them had ears of corn fall off the back of their muse, which in response to bars calls them shiftless and not careless. <laughs> A part of me feels like he didn't give them enough credit Maybe it was ingrained behavior to give uh, their best energy for their master, leaving minimal energy to care for themselves. I'm thinking also about the concept of trauma. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if mm -hmm. I'm making sense, but can you comment on this dynamic? I mean, you know, that's one of those questions where the person commented already. So I can I can say that the comment I I, I like as you as you as you can see from some of what like the tip of what I feel about this chapter. Um, honestly, I can't reconcile the dynamic, fam. Like just as, as a as a crafter of essays, I don't, I think this is a, I think this is, I think this is a lazy essay. I think it's one of the worst essays Du Bois has ever, has, has ever written, not just on a craft level, but I, and I'm not gonna talk about that with y'all unless y'all really want me to get into the craft, but but primarily because he's 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 using a group of people who are already used and he did not have to do it because he shows us later in the essay that all of this like plotting and showing of like black folks being less than and shiftless and sexually blah blah blah. You didn't you did not you didn't you didn't have to do it, but I think he did it for a reason. And that's yeah. what I don't want to say. I I I I I I don't think Du Bois, I'm not gonna say that. I, I wonder if Du Bois is, 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 is playing a role in this essay, similar to how Baldwin was playing in this essay, uh, Many Thousands Gone, right? He's writing from the point of view of a white Northern man. I wonder if Du Bois is playing in this, in this essay in that way, and or if he is actually saying what he sincerely believes, not just to white folk, but about the black, about the black peasants. And not black folk, I think it's important to say, but black working peasants. Peasants. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Stephanie Sneed asks, uh, how has du, uh, Du Bois's work, particularly in this chapter, reinforces uh, respectability politics within the academy, specifically for Black academics? <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, again, like, this is the, the wonder of Du Bois is, like, this is a, a cell in, like, a body of work, a, a literal cell. But because the boys is the boys, we have to like critique the cells if if when asked. And 
in this chapter, I think Du Bois is making the argument for well-kept, thoughtful, contained Black people. And if you just pay us, pay them and us the debt that you've owed us, you will see that we can be contained, careful, and we can work harder. That's the, the craziest, I mean, one of the, I'm sorry to use that word, but one of the strangest things to me that Du Bois says early in this is that Black workers, right? The reason white workers are better than Black workers is because they have better, they, 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 they have better accommodations. Right. I mean, I mean, yes, we want for, I, I want I want it and I want for our people to have the greatest accommodations. But that's a historical fam. Like you have to you can't just say that sociologists. You have to prove to me that these black people are like less efficient at work because that's you're talking about efficiency than white folk who have. And I'm not saying that all the black folk don't need to have. But I just think I, I, I think for sociologists, I think there's so many claims. I'm a former sociology major so many claims that are not substantiated because ultimately what you're relying on are, is a, the base belief that black is lack. And so I'm going here to tell you, you know what? Black is a little bit lack. But if you come back and, and like and pay your debt, black folk can be ample, much more ample than they are. And if, this, if we have much more time, I'm interested in like, does that mean white for Du Bois at this point? Like, I'm not sure. Yeah. That was just a provocative question. I actually don't want to ask that question at all. I'm just trying to, trying to provoke people. But anyway, well, that's, that's where I am. Yeah, D uh, Data Haynes uh, says, uh, W.B. was a distinguished social scientist. Was it wrong for him to use data uh, to truthfully chronicle the conditions he found? No, but what data substantiates that someone is shiftless or sexually immoral? Or sexually immoral? I want the dance. What I'm asking for is if we're going to hold the boys to that, I need the, the boys to back up that that claim. You need to you have to show me that black people are shiftless, careless, and sexually immoral. We're substantiated. If you substantiate it, okay, I'm still probably gonna say you lying, but he didn't even substantiate it. <laughs> um uh Andrew Blackman uh asked, uh, was it a literary device or is this what he felt right he saw? Well, see, this is what I'm saying. I didn't want to talk too much about craft because. I, I think so. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just be straight. Like I, I there are lots of literary devices that are used here, but 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 taking your opponent and or oppressor's worst understandings of who you actually are, Du Bois, even though you might not believe you are, but who you and Black folk from the, from the South are, and then actually saying, yeah, a lot of what you see in these Black motherfuckers, that's who they are. A lot, but you don't see a little bit, but I do, but I see it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it, fam. I don't buy it. And, and that's the wonderful thing about Du Bois, the, you know, the most meaningful black writer, thinker, creator, one of the most, two or three most meaningful in the world, I think it's important that he helped create a lineage of people who can look at his work and be like, you know what, just like a lot of us, sometimes you write some shit that's anti-black and fucking anti-poor and ridiculous. And that's what I feel about this chapter, but that's love, right? That's yeah. love to yeah. me. That's black love. Um, Stephanie sees it has classism within the black community served mm -hmm. to disrupt the relationship between upper middle class uh, black people and lower income black communities? As classism, is that the question? Mm hmm Ooh. Um, I don't even know how to answer that. As classism. Um, well, I, what, what I will say is I mean, yes, that's a yes, no question. Yes, I think so. What do you think? I, I think so too, but in, in because of Du Bois has been uh, labeled as a classist right. uh, or an elitist uh, mm -hmm. at times. And, and certainly um, Du Bois set out to be the best of anything. Um, you know, when somebody talks to him about uh, being the first PhD from Harvard, and he said, well, you know, uh, it was Harvard's uh, honor to have me. I love it. I love it, fam. That, that, this is what I'm trying to say about what, I, what my feelings is like, 
I am a conflict. Like with that quote from Du Bois is one of the like is one of the things that helps me get up in the morning, right? Yeah. You know, I know, Amina knows the institutions that have been lucky enough to have us have been lucky enough to have, have been lucky yeah. enough to have us. And yeah. a lot of folks can't say that. And one of the reasons that I can say that is because of Du Bois, right? But the flip side is that if you start to really internalize what you quote unquote got from academic institutions, and, and, you, and you distinguish what you got from people who have not had that opportunity, clear cut, and you don't look at any, I mean, in this chapter, again, we're looking at this chapter, we're not looking at, at anything else, but you don't see the, 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 the intellectual dexterity, you don't see the nuance, you don't see the, the what you know, Ellison called like the, 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 lower, the lower frequencies, you know, you, 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 you don't see the subtext. If you don't, if you don't, and I'm not, and my point is like, this is what some people say about my work. I'm not sure that if you see that subtext, you need to show it. But if you do show it, you have to show it with a bit more like finesse. People talk about literary devices. I mean, my G, like this is, if, if any chapter in this book needed much more like reliance on sensorium, like on the senses, I would say it's this chapter. Because in, in the absence of sensorium and sensory shit, he's reduced these 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 like fleshy, complicated black human beings into numbers. One could argue, and in two, one could argue into like like a cause. But what I'm saying is, he showed us that he has the literary tools at his at his display to not reduce people to numbers and causes. And I understand he's a sociologist, but we can't just be, when, when Du Bois fails to do what writers and cultural critics can do, we can't be like, that's what sociologists do. Because we know, actually that's not true. Some sociologists don't. But when, and, and when he goes beyond the bound, beyond the pale, we can be like, oh, this is, you know, this is how great he is. Yeah, and this chapter, I would say, this is what lazy sociologists do. That's what I would say, that's yeah. what I would say. Laura Wilson said, if you compare some of the language of Du Bois's um, and Booker T. Washington, I think you get more of a quote unquote hands off distance in Du Bois. Um, mm. That is to say, Washington talks about interaction with African American laborers and farmers, yes. much more in terms of contact and intimacy. While you can pick up on the vibe in Du Bois's of setting himself apart from the masses. I'm wondering if this has to do with uh, Du Bois as an empirical sociologist versus Washington right. as the vocational educator. Cornel West says that Du Bois never got down enough with his people. So. I mean, I mean, I, that's a great question slash statement. I, I mean, I, I don't know if he never got down enough because I think there's different ways to get down. Mm -hmm. But I, but but I do but I but I do think what we presuppose is that if you get down, one will respect. And I think the complicated thing that we see in Du Bois and also in lots of cultural workers is that getting down with the people. And I don't think he got down, but let's assume if he did, does not mean that you then render them um, lovingly even to to white audiences. You know, you can be down in, because we know there's so many folks who were down in the muck, so many ethnographers who were down in the mix, so many writers, poets who were down, but, you know, wrote prose that was like absolutely anti-Black woman, you know, absolutely so often anti-Black, so, so, so protective of this like shrouded intellect that so many of them feel like they got on their own. And so I, 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 I agree with that. I don't know if he didn't get down with his people or not, uh, enough, but I know that he didn't render his people lovingly or rigorously in this chapter that I was asked to talk about. I'll say that. Um, Wesley Bronson wants to make a, a statement that uh, he said this isn't a question. He wanted to add to the conversation that as an anthropologist, he can't help but read this chapter through the social evolutionary schemas that were mm -hmm. prevalent in colonial literature during the 1800s. Uh, he's thinking about E.B. Taylor and other right. armchair anthropologists. So he says here, I'm partly thinking uh, about this chapter through a certain mobilization of that genealogy. Maybe one is Professor Lehman is suggesting that aims to mobilize a quote unquote civilizing sentiment among his intended audience. Um, uh, I, I, I think about um, um, 
Martin's letter from the Birmingham jail, you know, mm -hmm. calling on, uh, calling on, uh, you know, people to to toe the line of what they say that they believe in. So um, maybe so. Um, uh, Dada Hay said, are not Du Bois's the descriptions of quote unquote hopeless serfdom powerful? Why decry yeah. these informative characterizations? He was a professor teaching with expectations of higher qualities of mankind, no matter what race. Absolutely, I, I agree. And I just think Du Bois should shift the optic and see himself as a student. And <laughs> I, I don't I don't know, but I just don't think I I, I don't think I would hope Du Bois is, would not be the kind of professor that would accept this sort of description of black labor and black people who happen to also be black laborers for 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 a paper. And and much more importantly, again, if we look at this as 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 we would as I would look at a workshop piece or piece of or essay somebody turned in, that's how I look at essays when people ask me to talk about essays. Let's talk about the beginning. Right before we read anything in this essay, we read <laughs> incredibly. But the brute said in his breast, "To the mills I grind have ceased. The riches shall be dust of dust. Dry ashes be the feast." Right, and we go on and on. But the, but but what Du Bois actually writes first is you know, somebody said they wanted to talk about craft for a second. When you talk about craft, you always have to talk about possibilities. So this essay begins. Um, have you ever seen a cotton field white with harvest? It's golden fleece hovering above the black earth like a silvery cloud edged with green, dark green. It's bold white signals waving like the foam of billows from Carolina to Texas across that black and human sea. Incredible beginning. I wonder what he gains from asking that question. But one of the things we have to say he does as, 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 as practitioners of late literary art is that when you ask that question, have you ever seen, I assume he's asking that question to folks who have not seen. That the assumption, like the 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 the, 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 the assumptions in that in that in that in that first in that first sentence read read that way, right? Like mm -hmm. have you ever seen a cotton field, blah, 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 blah. But much more importantly, what we see is when Du Bois, like Faulkner, is describing like the, the these landscapes that come alive that feel like landscapes that have heart of themselves and that these landscapes that feel wet with all of this sweat that is still sweating, wet from tears that can't stop flowing, right? Wet from like sexuality, wet. Why the fuck can't you use that wet, wonderful, luscious language to describe the black folks in here you claim to be advocating for? That's all I'm saying. You can't save your best, I mean, you can, but you have to be called out when you save your most rigorous lush descriptions for cotton fields that the black peasants who you demean work no nah, it can't work that way but it, it can but you can't ask all of us to not see what we see that 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 would be what i have to say uh donna godger says that moody's poem uh seems to express a similar passionate rage uh in in that kind of way absolutely um, yeah um, Professor Lehman, uh, an anonymous person asked, thank you for your critique. I wonder if, quote, the setup is done in the name of transparency, considering who the intended audience of the book is. Perhaps he saw himself as being objective as a social science and merely being descriptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not one of these people who have to respond to everything. That's a good, I gotta, I, I should think about that a little bit. I should, I don't, I don't know. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah there's okay. something to that. There's something to that. I think. And, and, and then um, the same person asked, do you see the chapter as a critique of the inhumanity of capitalism, i.e. the result of the quest of the golden fleece? Absolutely. And, 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 and all I'm saying, again, y'all, to tie a lot of these threads together is that, like, when we talk about writers and, 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 and our craft and these, like, tools we have on, on, our, on, on our belts, right? Some of us, I mean, the tools, I don't care what kind of writing you're doing, you need the tool of specificity. You need the tool of concrete language. You need the tool of making abstract language inviting. 
right? You need the tool of controlling the pace of the verbs. Like you need, if you want to, if you want something to be in future, you need to be aware of the way futures are working in your piece. You want, you want, you want, sometimes you want as, as many sensory things to happen as you want oral things to happen, right? So you, you, you want all of this kind of shit to happen in, 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 in your work. But all, all I'm asking us to consider is sometimes like our greats flub it. <laughs> and and what I'm really saying is like the stakes are too high to flub this one. Do you know what I'm trying to tell you? Like there, there are no, this is what I really want to tell y'all. It's I I love this project, but the only real black person in this essay that is about the masses, and he talks about the thousands of black people. The one real black person in this essay is named W.E.B. Du Bois. That's fucking nuts. The one real black person. That scene he describes at the end, it, it's, you know, it, 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 it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have a middle, it doesn't have an end. You, none of the, the black boys in there get, get, not point of view, but they don't even get perspective. And what I'm trying to say is that somebody who writes for a living, writes cultural work, often writes to white folk who, you know, are the editors or the fucking blah, 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 blah. I think, I think the, the lapses we all fall into because of capitalism, not just capitalism, capitalism, cis heteropatriarchy and fucking overt white supremacy. And it's not the same shit that, that the boys went through, but some of it is the same. And all my, my argument is just that like, like we can't laud lazy writing, just like we just can't laud it. I don't give a fuck if it comes from Baldwin, Morrison, Du Bois, or whomever. You can't. And this is, it's, it's lazy in the way that the nation has been lazy. I don't mm. care what you say. Those people, those, those thousands of black people you describe are not careless. I don't care what you say. Those those thousands of black people, and really you talking about those black women are not sexually loose. And if they are, you have to explain to me why those descriptors are what you want these white folks to know when they already believe it. And then you want to flip it at the end and say they're, they're, they're that, but they're actually more than that. Well, who are you, W.E.B.? Who are you? <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> um, Emily Ellis asks, can you comment on the paragraph that begins quote, it is easy for us to lose ourselves in details. Oh, yes. I, I, I marked that. I, I thought that was, again, like this is, this is to me, well, one, to whom is the, uh, who, who is us? It's either, you know, like, you know, again, like I would suggest everybody who read this essay tonight, please go and read this essay, Many Thousands Gone by James Baldwin. Bowen is letting you know, I am writing from the point of view of a white, uh, cis, heterosexual, liberal man, right? And he starts that essay, it is only in their music that the Negro has been able to blah, 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 that he's been able to tell his story. But he's, but he's showing, he's trying to show W.E. Du Bois's, I think, entirety of work shows, which is that white folks know black folks better than white folks know themselves. Now watch, I'm going to write from the perspective of a white person talking about how what I really want from black people is not freedom, but personality obliteration. I just think Baldwin pulls this essay off better than <laughs> the boys pulls off this essay. That's not a diss, because I think that's one of the incredible essays in the world. But I also just think, yeah, I'm 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 really open to what people are or some folks are trying to say though, right? Which is yeah, we kind of yeah. gotta we kind of gotta be a little bit more kind to the to yeah. the to the dude. Okay. Karen Levine asks, I find myself wondering if you are talking about the implication that Du Bois felt a personal need to distance himself from what he saw in people who looked like him, but were so different from a class perspective, in much the way German Jews felt the need to distance themselves from the peasant Eastern mm -hmm. European Jews leading into and following the Holocaust, a kind of identification with the aggressor. Absolutely, but I think the shift is that, again, if we, if we, we broaden out beyond this essay, is that, you know, we, we've seen Du Bois talk about the efficacy and the potency and the life-givingness of sorrow songs, right? Like mm -hmm. the commutative, the, 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 the communal construction of the, ironically, a lot of these same folks who he says, white people pretty much have like dictated who we've become. And it's just like, so it's just, it's, it, that's what I'm trying to say. If you're going to be a sociologist, be a fucking sociologist. Like uh, fundamental sociology teaches us, right? That 
enculturation was not wholly successful, right? Like we didn't, we weren't wholly enculturated. Like we, there were, there were carryovers. We hung on to some shit. And what we hung on to was not sexual fucking immorality, careless. I'm not saying that we aren't sometimes careless and sexually immoral and all of that shit. We are. But my question is like, when trying to get white folk to owe a debt, why are those the characteristics that you need to not only utter, but repeat and use as punctuation as, as like, as, as refrains throughout this essay? Yeah. Um, Gretchen Long, who was with us last week from Williams College asked, I'm trying to make sense of this chapter too. I'm going to go back to the original Atlantic article and have a look. Could it be that he is mimicking, mimicking the way that some Northern reformers talked about immigrants, particularly Catholics from Ireland and Southern Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, his own data from the chapter before this contradicts most of this mess. Right. I guess I, I agree. I disagree. I agree with that. OK. Um, Ernest, Ernestine uh, Mendez asked, do you think that he was trying to differentiate differenti between American African Americans based on social economic standings? We are not all the same. Don't paint us with the same brush. What do you think about that, Dr. Johnson? I, 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 I don't think he was. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I think that that, that description comes later on historically. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I don't think Du Bois was actually trying to, to do that at that point in period of time. In fact, I think that his overall kind of thing was uh, looking at the humanity of the souls of Black people, because at that point in time um, in America, and, and we, this is from the white audience point of view, Black people did not have a soul. Right. They, didn't, they were not human, you know, that they, they were looked at as more as he talks about in another chapter that they are these in-between people, you know, that's not mm -hmm. quite animalistic, mm -hmm. but also not higher in class, right? And so right. I think that he is trying to weave through that in most of the of the text of the souls of black folk. I mean, that's the Absolutely. essence of yeah and, yeah. and I feel like we can't, I just hope people, I hope we don't lose that, right? Um, because on one hand, what you're saying is, yes, it's reactionary, right? Like white folks think we're soulless. He's going to talk about the souls. Mm -hmm. But in talking about the souls, remarkably and wonderfully, he talks about the communal genius that, mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is embedded in like this sort of Black survival, right? Like mm -hmm. so, and I just think we don't see that much in this chapter, but we do see that in the larger book and definitely in like some of his other work. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, think, I think the boys will look back at this chapter at... at I mean, I wonder if Du Bois would look back at this chapter, let's say like after after Black Reconstruction and be like, damn, I wish I wouldn't have written that. I wonder, you know, like maybe, maybe not. But I, I think in, in some of his note in his notebooks, he said that he thought about rewriting or revising the mm -hmm. Soul Black Folk, uh, but he decided not to uh, accept change in some words that he talked about the Jewish people. He went back and he changed a little bit of that. But he said he wanted it to leave it as a part of history of, of himself at that point and period of time. Uh, and he said the, the, the awful thing about himself, he says, I lived so long that I got to change my mind several times, you know. And uh, it's very, very interesting to see a scholar over a long uh, arch and the way that he did change his uh, mind yes. and, and his philosophy over time. And so what yes. we get in, in this Souls of Black Folk is a very early W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, in his thinking. I mean, he grows tremendously right. from this 1903 text uh, to back to Black Reconstruction and certainly, um, you know, on, on some of the other work that he does, especially in the crisis. Uh, so, uh, but that's what we're supposed to do, right? Uh, we live and we're supposed to grow. And, and as a writer, I think we're supposed to grow in, in some ways at, at, at that, you know, hopefully, you know, we can kind of look back and say, darn, I wrote that then, um, yes. you know, <laughs> yes. And, 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 and like my grandma would say like, God, you know, uh, God bless the writer or the person who can't look back and see that they made a mistake. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, 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 yeah. and I think like because Du Bois was able to live so long and create damn near the whole time. I mean, that is that is why we are, we owe him such a debt. And I hope people understand that. I think the authors, the authors, particularly like the black authors that I owe the debts to, I have to rigorously engage with their text as I would want them to rigorously engage with me. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not, and, and, and but at the same time, it's sort of hard. You're, you're like, man, I don't even want to say nothing critical about this dude. He made me, you know? <laughs> but, you know, just like your mama, you have to talk, you, you have to look at, you know, the the things that went wrong as well as the things that went right, right? But wait, here's a question. But do you have to do that with your children too? Well, um... <laughs> I oh, know that's right. We're not gonna go there, <laughs> Professor Layman. We're not gonna oh, go there. All right, all right, all right. Uh, um, Leo asks: Is Du Bois playing both sides? Is he playing turncoat in order to gain uh, entree into an audience? Uh, I mean, I think he's trying to persuade. I think so. I think he's trying to persuade. Um, I mean, again, that's the generous reading, you know. Um, I, I don't I don't know how else to make it. You know, I've I've been I try not to put myself in the position of a writer of trying to persuade white people to see their inhumanity and or see the ways their inhumanity has harmed black people because because again, like the easy way to do it always reduces black folks to simply being like 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 consequences of white negligence, evil, supremacy, whatever you want to call it. But the but the, but the problem is like we're ne we we are never just simply like I I I think I think we can look at white folks and be like yeah structurally they have taken and there's a debt owed. But I I just don't want to work on this idea that like black people are emotionally, psychologically fractured more so than white folk just because white folk haven't paid their debt. When we see every day the way these people who owe a debt are intellectually, soulfully, any way you can talk about, just like decrepit. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying all white people are decrepit, but I'm just trying to say like, like when I read this chapter, white folk who, are, who have done harm and who believe that black folk are shiftless and therefore not worthy of anything, like I don't think the white folk get the get the get the get get critique get the get the harshest critique get the most rigorous critique. Um, I I I I think he's playing. I think I think he's playing. Like look 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 at what you made. They can't even walk straight. Look at what you made. They like to have so much sex. Like if you come back and do right, they won't be this way. Come on, fam. No, that's a lie. <laughs> People who made me are that and so much more. Yeah. as our white folks, you yeah. know? Um, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, two last questions. Um, Marissa asks again, the more I hear you all speak, the more I believe that multiple ideas in this chapter are not, in fact, integrated. If he is yeah. speaking in code, maybe this is why he refers to himself in this chapter as, quote, Carl Window sociologist, unquote. Yes, I love, yeah, <laughs> yes. great point. I think that's a great point. Yeah, um, Amanda Kleintop, hello, uh, Professor Kleintop. Uh, thanks for a great discussion. Can you say a little more along the lines of the question you brought up earlier about whether Du Bois was thinking about winder, women or gender queer folks when he talks about sexual looseness? What happens when we consider them in the chapter uh, in your comments. Right, okay, and, and, and this is where I think we have to, I have to, the, the easier way for me to answer that question is to implicate myself, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm, in, when I'm in college, my first year in college, I read all the race men, I saw that the race men, when they were talking about the black community would say stuff like the black man, right? The black man this, the black man this, uh, he this, he this, he this, he this, he this. And I just think as 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 creators, I I, I think <laughs> we have like we need to be specific when we use pronouns, right? You talk about craft, like this is this is a like often people think content and craft don't go together. It doesn't take a deep reader to understand that Du Bois was like most of us today and back then. I would say, in some ways, a misogynist, right? And 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 in other ways, 
like deeply committed to like a, a cis heteropatriarchal understanding of the world. Meaning that when you talk about black people, you talk about black men. But when you talk about black women, you can talk about black women sort of with a wink wink by talking about like their looseness and whatnot, right? And all I'm just saying is that Du Bois has shown himself even in this book to be, to slow that down. So what happens when you actually slow that down? And I think to slow it down, you just can't talk about black people at large or black women and their looseness. You know what I mean? You, 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 you just can't do that. And so I'm just saying one, the person, the pronoun usage, of course, but also like the ways he decides, he, he doesn't distinguish or differentiate the labor practices. He doesn't distinguish or differ, di differentiate like the practices that happen, not just in the house, but right outside the house or further from the house. He doesn't, he doesn't distinguish or differ, di differentiate in this chapter, which is really at the root about like capitalism, how white folks need to own what they've taken so black folk writ large can have more it, it, it's it's not i don't think he's he's clear about when he's talking about black people moving into towns and moving here there and other i'm not sure that he's that he even imagines black women as being part and parcel of that that movement in this essay in this essay and so that's why i'm trying to say like almost every writer in the world you can just see all kind of slippages and blind spots when it comes to the way Du Bois understood not just like poverty, black, southern poverty, but also women, not just gender, but like women and gender queer folk don't come into this shit at all for him, which is we, we have to, I guess, understand. But black women, I think, don't actually like at this point in his career mm -hmm. in this essay. And I think later on we see we see something different happen. But I don't I don't, I don't think he knows how to use his craft to explore all that black women give and take from communities, right? And I'm saying give and take because everybody gives and takes, right? Yeah. yeah. Where some of the sisters are going to school him a little bit later on, so. Yes, I, I, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there listening. I'm so thankful yeah. for this. This is my last talk thing I have to do before Christmas. I'm so grateful for y'all, so, so grateful. Thank you, Dr. Joel Sneed, I'm so thankful. Yes. Um, Thank you so much for being with us this evening. This has been such a rich conversation. And um, we wish you the best in your rest before you start all of the other things that you have to do. And so if you haven't read his book, Heavy, uh, I, I suggest that you pick up a copy um, that it has been really revealing to me and my family. And so uh, I think it will be a great read for you as well. Next, uh, we're not going to be back until after the break. We'll be back on uh, January 12th when our guest will be Dr. Dolan Hubbard. Uh, he will join us to discuss Chapter 9 of the Sons of Master and Man. Uh, Dr. Hubbard is a retired professor and chairperson of the Department of English at Morgan State University. And so we look forward to that. Please help us create an African-American Culture Center in the Berkshires uh, and stay tuned uh, to a little video um, after this uh, talking about the, the center one way or the other. Thank you, Professor Lehman. Thank you so much, Professor John Snead. Thank y'all. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Hello, I'm Ray Gunn, chairman of the Clinton Church Restoration Project. We are creating a nonprofit center for African American history and culture at the historic Clinton Amy Zion Church in Gray Barrington which I attended for over 70 years. The Berkshires are rich with black history that is little known and sometimes misunderstood. For example, my ancestor, Agrippa Hull, 
served in the Revolutionary War and was the largest black landowner in Stockbridge. Once completed, our center will tell his story and those of W.E.B. Du Bois, Reverend Esther Dozier, and many more. Please help by donating to this historic project. We need your support. Thank you. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, Before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, I went to the rock to hide my face. Rock cried out, no hiding place, no hiding place down there. Gonna pitch tent on the old campground. Pitch my tent on the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent on the old campground. Give that devil another round. No hiding place down there. See, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, went to the rock, had my face. Rock cried out, no hiding place. No hiding place down there. No hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there.